Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Walter Trezek. I'm the chair person of the consultative committee of the UPU. We are starting um, the first uh, webinar of uh, our webinar trilogy dedicated uh, to the e-commerce pillar of the consultative committee. Today's uh, webinar is um, uh, focusing on e-commerce logistics and how it is being transformed as a result of COVID-19. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to announce that we have a quite distinguished panelists today. Um, I would like to ask you uh, to mute your um, microphones, uh, post any of your questions in the chat anytime. Um, I will take the opportunity to pick uh, questions and uh, post them directly to the participants. Um, and uh, with that, um, let me just um, announce that this is the first of three uh, webinars dedicated uh, to the e-commerce pillar, to e-commerce as such. We are planning a second webinar already on the 20th. 8th of April, uh, dedicated to the e-shopper behaviors and how they are changing in the context um, of COVID. A third one is already planned uh, for the 19th of May uh, on redefining the universal service obligation in a changing digital postal environment. Uh, we will, of course, um, inform you accordingly uh, about those those webinars um, uh, on time. I would like to um, welcome our speakers um, and uh, it is a pleasure uh, to introduce the uh, Secretary General of E-Commerce Europe, uh, Luca Cassetti, who will give us a keynote um, coming from E-Commerce Europe as they conducted surveys on the impact um, of the uh, coronavirus on e-commerce. Um, the floor is yours, uh, Luca. Please give us your insights. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter, for your introduction. Um, it has been more than a year ago uh, now that the coronavirus has started to spread throughout Europe. And I think we can all say that it has had an immense effect on our lives, the way we socialize, the way we work, and of course, also the way we shop and consume products. Uh, as you rightly said, Walter, e-commerce Europe conducted a few surveys in the past months of the pandemic. And the most recent one was around Christmas, uh, and so the holiday period, to try to assess the impact of COVID-19 on e-commerce. And the target of these surveys were always our national e-commerce associations throughout Europe, which are now 23. So I, I think we can safely uh, say that e-commerce has proved to be crucial for the continuation of economic activities in Europe, but also for the functioning of the society over the last year. And we believe that it is still crucial. Uh, you have noticed that consumers have started to rely more and more on e-commerce uh, to safely access uh, the products they needed in everyday life. Uh, and that ranging from essential products like groceries and health related products to equipment to work from home or entertainment, uh, you know, to go through the lockdown. A little bit easier way. But because of national lockdown measures, unfortunately, uh, many brick and mortar physical retailers have been obliged to close their physical stores. Uh, but they also developed some sort of online presence to be able to stay afloat, to survive, and making use, therefore, of uh, seamless commerce or omni, omni channel commerce solutions to accommodate uh, consumer needs during this very difficult period. So an interesting trend uh, in terms of consumption that we have uh, recently noticed in some countries is that consumers remain somehow more attached than ever to their local merchants. Uh, we have noticed that in France, for example. Uh, but these consumers now expect uh, these businesses to also offer some sort of e-commerce service uh, in addition to the brick and mortar store that they already operate. And this was started by many players, uh, for example, with the implementation of click and collect solutions. However, the situation in the EU regarding uh, uh, non-essential shops providing click and collect services remains a bit fragmented. And that came out from our survey as well. 
uh, because this, this service sometimes is allowed in member states, uh, uh, in some of them at least, uh, but in some others it is limited, sometimes it is even fully restricted. So this is a clear example that diverging rules are in place uh, across Europe, but also on a national level on, uh, on click and collect. And in general, fragmentation emphasizes the importance of having a, a more harmonized European approach on issues like click and collect. Uh, so to have a sort of uh, level playing field within the single market. So these things are of course a challenge, but also a great opportunity for businesses and retail in general to innovate, I would say. And the lesson that we should learn from the, from the first lockdown is clear. So we, we witnessed an exponential growth in um, distant payments and distance logistics. Uh, I mentioned click and collect before, but there are different forms of click and collect, including contactless click and collect. And we actually entered a world with uh, new ways for consumers to shop, pay, and get products delivered safely to their home. And I'm 100% convinced that this is something that will remain even when the crisis will be over, but it needs more harmonization, it needs more resilience as well. Um, maybe in terms of difference between the aftermath of the first and the second lockdowns, uh, there has been an improvement in the resiliency of the delivery sector as reported in our last survey. On average, postal and parcel delivery services have better adapted to the second lockdown. Uh, there were overall smaller delays uh, um, flagged by our members, despite the increased number uh, of packages to deliver, especially when uh, we, we run our service or around the Christmas holidays. Some respondents to the survey have also flagged the fact that due to um, the combined effects of strict lockdown measures, a shift in consumer behavior towards e-commerce and the increased demand around the Christmas period Parcel delivery operators had to further adapt, uh, for instance, by opening extra pickup points to manage the increased flow of parcels. So here I want to really mention the great work that has been done by, by the postal and parcel delivery operators over the past months in uh, ensuring that consumers can actually get their orders safely at home. So this is a clear example of how the parcel market is gradually changing and evolving and adapting to the new situation of increased uh, e-commerce activities. Uh, but an important point that I want to make uh, here today is that at e-commerce Europe, we see the lines between online and offline commerce becoming increasingly blurred because we are moving towards uh, what we call seamless commerce, uh, seamless commerce uh, or omnichannel commerce. So the COVID-19 crisis has really demonstrated, in my opinion, the importance of digital and especially the fact that there is complementarity between physical commerce and e-commerce from, from the other side. And we believe that this trend is set to accelerate also after the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic was a, was a great uh, accelerating factor in this sense. And the shift towards uh, these omni-channel solutions is parallel to a shift in consumer habits and expectations. So if we take another survey that was done in Germany, uh, consumers uh, are increasingly demanding companies to be present online and new companies are increasingly starting their own business online. And according to this recent study that was made by one of our members, 87% of German consumers now expect companies to have an online portal. And 67% of new startups in Germany operate through a purely digital business model. Uh, so to give you an idea of comparison, this represents a 5% 5 increase compared to the previous year. So increased opportunities to create consumer-centric products and experiences thanks to new technologies are expected to take e-commerce, I would say, up and beyond its current scope and scale in the years to come. And the online channel will basically reshape our understanding of, of commerce further. Another important trend that I think it is worth mentioning is the shift towards a more sustainable consumption. And e-commerce Europe strongly believes in the opportunity that is offered up by the so-called twin digital and green transition. And we actually welcome the work that the European Commission is conducting on you know, the role that consumers can also play in these transitions because consumers can be an important force in the shift to a greener economy. Starting for example, from the choices they make when they purchase products and services, but more broadly, 
you know, in adopting generally responsible behaviors, for example, in relation to recycling, sorting of waste, and so on. And that's why we are convinced that the possibility of leveraging digitalization and digital tools uh, to empower consumers uh, can also be an important factor in the, in the green transition because digital tools can give consumers better access to complementary information they need across channels and not only before the purchase, but also after the purchase. And that can happen throughout the, the product's life cycle. Life cycle. That's for the consumers, but as a sector, I think we are also determined to make a positive contribution to, to the green transition. And that not only to meet consumers' increasing demand for, uh, for greener commerce, uh, but it, it is also a strategic business priority for many companies. Um, many innovative solutions are actually being employed already and are still developed in uh, not only European countries, but also abroad. And within e-commerce Europe, what we are trying to do is really to stimulate a little bit uh, the, the knowledge sharing among these companies. Uh, for example, through the collaborative report on sustainability and e-commerce that we published, uh, I think it was last year in September, and we are planning on updating it this year. Just to mention a few initiatives in this, in this field, AI, artificial intelligence, is increasingly used to plan efficient and greener delivery routes. There is an increasing number of greener, green delivery means uh, by bike, by electrical vehicles. In general, I think that digital can allow better stock management and supply chain traceability. Initiatives like digital labeling can reduce the need for paper. Uh, more and more companies are developing uh, recyclable and uh, also reusable packaging in some cases. Uh, and there is an increasing number of uh, e-commerce warehouses without forgetting the, the, the more concrete fact that maybe digital facilitates also the sales of secondhand products, giving them a, a second life actually. At the same time, with, uh, with our work on sustainability at e-commerce Europe level, we are trying to respond to some preconception uh, that sometimes rise around uh, online purchases in general. Uh, for example, the fact that e-commerce has allegedly a disastrous carbon footprint, but if we take, for example, countries like France, uh, according to another recent survey, out of 10 people delivered at home, seven of them actually declared that they would have taken a motor vehicle if they had had to go to a physical store. But again, I want to, to flag this important point for me that it is not about online versus offline, because we need to go beyond these preconceptions. It is actually the combination of digital and physical retail that is the key to make a positive contribution to the green transition. So to say it in, other, in, another word, in, a, in other words, the choice to be made is not to buy online or in a physical store because this difference is becoming more and more irrelevant, but the choice is to buy responsibly regardless of the channel used. And it's important also to mention that this transition is involving all players starting from the businesses who are constantly proposing uh, new innovative and responsible initiatives to public authorities, which support the retail sector in its uh, digital omnichannel transformation. And finally, to all of us, because at the end we are all consumers, so we should act responsibly in that sense. And of course, an important step to facilitate a business's contribution to this transition and empowering consumers is having more harmonization at European level. I, may, I mentioned it already before, whether it concerns extended producer responsibility or the definition of concepts like secondhand or refurbished goods and so on, more harmonization of the legal framework in Europe would definitely help uh, uh, cross-border e-commerce, specifically cross-border e-commerce. Maybe having a look at the perception of e-commerce uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, uh, um, all respondents to our survey, so all our national associations, uh, reported a quite positive public perception for the sector. Um, the majority of them reported a positive political perception as well. Just a majority, not all of them, because in some countries there have been indeed objections raised about the negative effects of e-commerce on local brick and mortar shops. But uh, I have to say that the answers to our surveys the experiences that have been reported by our members clearly demonstrate that e-commerce as such became 
uh, a lifeline for many traditional brick and mortar businesses that had to close down because of the lockdown measures. And so they were allowed to continue their activities uh, during this, uh, this difficult period. And at the same time, e-commerce has greatly helped consumers access goods safely from their home. I also want to make another important point uh, because despite the strong demand in e-commerce these last months, uh, our survey shows a nuanced image of the impact of COVID-19 on the industry. It is true that there are many, that there, yes, there are many sectors that have generally seen an increase in sales, but there is also a significant segment that has experienced a huge decrease in sales. Some sectors even dealt with a complete lack of sales. Uh, take, for example, e-commerce services like travel, online ticket sales, they all experienced huge losses in this period. Another example, talking about products, uh, is the fashion sector. Uh, according to the, the, the experiences reported by our members, the fashion sector has seen some improvements compared to the first wave of the pandemic, specif specifically regarding homeware. Uh, but the demand for other types of, of fashion items like shoes and attire remains pretty low still now. But I, I would like to try to conclude on a more positive note maybe because the majority of the respondents to, to um, our questionnaire remain hopeful for the future, noting that the acceleration of the digitalization of both businesses and consumers in Europe, which is basically a direct consequence of the pandemic, will result in continuous growth for the digital commerce sector. So I think we can safely say that we expect a definitive growth in product sales in 2021, and potentially a little growth of, in the sales of services. But of course, that's depending on the severity of the COVID-19 measures and how the, the pandemic uh, will uh, evolve. And with that, I would like to conclude. And I thank you very much for having invited me today for uh, giving this keynote speech. Thank you very much. Thank you, Duca. Thank you very much. Uh, just one quick question before we move on um, to the panelists. And of course, please, please uh, stay online, Luca, because we count on you to be one of our panelists as well. Um, just one, one uh, quick question to you. Um, where can uh, the survey you mentioned uh, be found and accessed? And um, is there more uh, information available? Uh, the survey is available uh, on our website. So if you go on e-commerce-europe.eu, you end up in, uh, on our homepage, and then you have a, a banner with a direct link to download the survey. We made other surveys in the past, so there is a COVID-19 section on our website. You can go there and, and find also the older results. Uh, the other surveys that I mentioned, so the French one and the German one, they are not directly available on our website, but if you're interested, feel free to send me an email and I am happy to direct uh, anybody who's interested to the, to the correct surveys uh, on the website of our national associations. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And please share uh, perhaps uh, perhaps uh, the link uh, in, in the chat so it is available to all our participants. Um, with that, um, I would like to introduce um, our panelists. Um, we have now um, a session of um, highly distinguished um, experts uh, coming from various um, areas of uh, e-commerce logistics. And I would like to start uh, with uh, Glyn Huge, who is uh, the Director General of the International Air Cargo Association, TIACA, which was recently uh, founded. And uh, with that, um, I would like to um, <clears throat> move into um, the uh, session. Cross-border postal traffic uh, has been hit hard when most passenger aircraft were grounded uh, during the pandemic and many destinations were not available anymore. What, was it possible to switch to air cargo and replace the missing um, passenger aircraft capacity? What have been the lessons learned during the ongoing pandemic? Glyn, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Walter. And uh, it gives me pleasure as well to participate in this very important session today. Um, first of all, I have to say congratulations to Luca and his organization for you know, performing a, a fantastic survey. And the information that he presented just in a few minutes was uh, exceptional. And I would encourage everybody to read the report in full detail because it really highlights 
how the fact that uh, e-commerce became integrated with the stay-at-home economy. Um, it became a lifeline, both for businesses and for the consumer, as uh, normal consumer behavior was interrupted. Um, and it also addressed the issue of, will I be home to, to receive my delivery? So it almost created the perfect scenario to boost the e-commerce growth even further. Um, now, from an air cargo perspective, coming specifically to your questions, Walter, um, e-commerce has been one of the aspects which has helped air cargo volumes to return pretty much to pre-COVID levels. But what we've seen over the last 12 months is a dramatic impact in the actual supply side of the capacity. Historically, as I'm sure everybody on this uh, that's participating today is aware, that about 50% of air cargo would traditionally move in the bellies of passenger aircraft. Those passenger aircraft provided global connectivity, which was exactly what the postal network and the e-commerce providers actually needed, global connectivity with ready available to plenty of capacity. So when you take about 60 or 70% of that capacity away, it has a huge impact on the, the, on the demand, which had actually reduced by not very much. Um, and more importantly, how do you actually satisfy that demand? So we saw two very significant changes over the last 12 months. Firstly, we saw um, freighter networks enhance their utilization and their um, capabilities as much as possible. We saw a number of uh, deferred aircraft reti retirements. Some freighter aircraft that were parked in the desert were brought back into service to try and shore up that lack of capacity. And then we saw something which nobody had actually foreseen, which was the fact that with airlines having grounded about 60 to 70% of their passenger fleets, many airlines actually started mobilizing these grounded aircraft for cargo only operations. And at one point, there was about 2,500 passenger aircraft being utilized for cargo only services. And of that, there was about 300 of those which actually had the seats removed um, so they could become even uh, greater uh, or could have an even greater capacity with lower weight. Now, that was a way of getting through that incredible um, challenge with regards to the, the capacity crisis. Um, but with the price of oil increasing, it does make the economics of flying those aircraft um, permanently a little bit more challenging. But it is crucial to keep that uh, network maintained. And particularly when I read that, uh, I think it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, wrong Walter, but about 20% of post at one point was stranded during the pandemic, which just reinforces the way that the postal system relies upon um, the passenger network, particularly when it comes to Latin America and Africa, where there traditionally hasn't been a lot of freighter networks. So the industry is having to come up with alternative, more permanent solutions to ensure that there is ready access available for the, the e-commerce industry and the postal networks. Um, but one of the challenges that comes as a result of that is the focus on volume. With the volume of capacity, or sorry, with the volume of demand now pretty much at pre-COVID levels, but capacity is still significantly down, every space, every square inch is actually coming under quite a bit of challenge. Um, so I think going forward, there'll probably be, an, and I think this goes to what Luca was saying as well about responsible purchases and looking at the environmental impact. I think going forward, there will probably need to be more focus on things such as volume, volume utilization, packaging, um, and that's not just outer packaging in terms of um, recyclable materials, et cetera, but it's also product packaging. You know, we know that, that a lot of toys and things are packaged for visual display in stores, but if people are purchasing online, there isn't perhaps that need for so much plastic to go into the packaging. So we might be able to get smaller products, et cetera, being, being moved. So therefore it could have, again, a greater ability to look at the environment and utilization of the aircraft. Um, so, you know, I'm, I was trying to touch upon all, all the areas there, and, and I know time is, is somewhat limited, but to, to certainly look at the next three or four years, which is the current forecast time frame before the passenger networks, international passenger networks will be fully resumed. I think there'll be continued challenges in terms of uh, access to capacity for both uh, traditional mail, as well as, as it were, the, the more um, modern version of, of the small parcels, which of course is related to e-commerce. 
Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, um, for your um, first uh, um, insights uh, on our topic. Um, with that, I would like to move uh, to the Universal Postal Union and would like to introduce uh, Noor, Noor Adam, um, responsible for the supply chain management coordination of the Universal Postal Union. Uh, Noor, um, with the boom uh, of e-commerce, um, the designated operators dominate the market uh, disruption of uh, low weight e-commerce consignments. However, uh, the le legislative landscape and the regulatory requirements for this e-commerce consignments uh, have changed from the 1st of January 2021 with the coming into force of the UPU's electronic advanced data regulations and some national and reg regional legislations, um, such as the US Stop Act and the upcoming um, EU um, ECS2 regulations. So uh, Noah, how is the UPU helping and supporting its members and the designated operators to achieve compliance with the electronic advance, data regulatory requirements, and all that kind of digitalization. No, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Walter, and uh, good day to all. Uh, and uh, nice to meet some of my old friends like Glenn, Eddie, in this new normal way of doing business. And we all hope that we will get out of this sooner. Having said that, as you have just stated, uh, Walter, the designated operators did dominate the distribution of uh, low weight and the two kilo e-commerce consignment. However, uh, the upcoming uh, of the regulations and that are now in force from January 2021, definitely had, and the preparation towards it, COVID did had an impact on that. So as you said, the EPU community definitely knew 2021 was coming as far back as 2005. And therefore, the coming into force of the EAD regulations in 2021, uh, and more specifically January, for the UPU community and the designated operators was expected. The UPU has been preparing for these regulatory requirements and according to the UPU's roadmap for EAD implementation, which was a result of an adoption of the Postal of Operation Council way back in 2015, the UPU established an EAD steering committee to develop a roadmap and the associated milestones for electronic advanced data adoption and implementation. Some of the milestones achieved at the UPU on the regulatory fronts include, first of all, the adoption of the Doha Congress in 2012 of Articles 8 of the Convention on Postal Security, and of course, the subsequent adoption of POC of the associated regulatory provisions. The, another milestone is the development of the global postal model for the union in response to the emerging uh, EAD requirements. And another milestone is the adoption of the roadmap. The guiding principles for the roadmap was to ensure that it is efforts help prepare the UPU members for the adoption of the requirements that have now come into force. Uh, the state objectives uh, were addressing several areas uh, and activities. First is the outreach activities to identify the exact nature of the EAD requirements. This, was in, this involves engaging with the other stakeholders in the industry uh, and regulators and associations, such as the World Custom Organization, the International Civil Aviation Organization, uh, IATA, the European Commission, and so on. Another main area of uh, work for the roadmap was to build and test, as I said, the global postal model to meet EAD requirements. And this was built, uh, to be built and test floor by floor in terms of the messaging standards required and the needs uh, that will come with that. IT systems, solutions, of course, and operational procedures that need to be put in place. Another very important area was awareness raising and capacity building initiatives among the UPU member countries of the need to meet the EAD requirements. And then to support our union member countries, the UPU has several ongoing technical support initiatives such as the UPU's quality of service common fund project, uh, namely the EAD data capture transmission and compliance project in which 143 member countries 
are currently benefiting from this project and participating. Another major support, as uh, maybe some of you are aware, is from the US Tide Fund, which was earmarked for EAD during the extraordinary Congress of the UPU in Geneva in 2018, I think, 19, sorry. Currently, around 158 DOs, therefore, are already sending the mandatory electronic advance period declaration, custom declaration for international postal items containing goods. Uh, again, with EAD comes something very important, which is the commercial opportunities that are associated with it. Uh, well, 2020, therefore, was both very important and critical for the UPU, as this was the final year of preparations for the EAD regulation requirements that were then upcoming in 2021. Similar to all other sectors and economies, COVID-19 massively disrupted the planned operation, uh, preparations. However, the UPU community showed resilience and quickly adapted to the situation and uh, therefore adapted to the new normal way of conducting business, which is what we are doing today, online or remote platforms. Between the two main global UPU technical support projects I mentioned, over, over 30 regional online workshops were done in 2020 for all the UPU regions, uh, Latin America, Africa, English speaking, Africa, French speaking, Caribbean, Asia, Pacific, Europe, and, uh, and uh, the Arab region. During 2020 also, 135 designated operators received individual remote custom declaration system training and deployment. And we plan to continue with the same for 2021. Therefore, the UPU has been working very, very hard and supporting the member countries to be ready for the 2021 regulations that are with us. And uh, that's where we are now. And of course, we'll want to continue with the same uh, for 2021. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Noah. Uh, and please stay online uh, because uh, we will have the pleasure to um, put another question to you, uh, very much related, of course, to the UPU global postal model. And I would like to take the opportunity also as the chair of the consultative committee that member, uh, many of our um, consultative committee members are actually quite involved in uh, electronic advanced data. One of which uh, will be the next panelist. Um, Eddie uh, Richové um, is the CEO of uh, Shop Run uh, Back. Um, he's very much engaged, of course, uh, in uh, the Asian cross Europe, cross international um, e-commerce markets. And with that, uh, um, Eddie, traffic from Asia has been severely hit by the pandemic. Uh, what have been the solutions to keep the mail flowing? China uh, recovered to a large extent already. Uh, what have been the lessons learned to avoid disruptions in cross-border commercial delivery? The floor is yours, Eddie. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Walter. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me during this um, nice session. Um, thank you, Luca, Glyn, and uh, Noah for, for the preparation. Um, so, Walter, I, I, I would say that the Chinese online seller is probably the most well-prepared uh, community in the world. Um, I would say the, at the very beginning of 2020, um, the pandemic did affect the air traffic and air freight capacity, as Glyn mentioned due to the commercial flight cancelling. But um, what we realized is like in um, two months, all airlines transformed passenger plane to load cargo, um, which was quite, quite amazing and, um, and fast. So such a rapid change recovered the cargo capacity for shipping from Asia. And um, during, uh, I would say that during the, the early stage of pandemic, uh, in the same time, many logistic company are lack of manpower, but um, these companies were already well trained during the, the double 11 peak of the past six years that uh, they have to afford. Um, so they are familiar with working under capacity shortage, I would say. And um, on the top of that, that uh, we can see players build new uh, capacity, new gateway terminal, like in Liège, for example, for, for, for Alibaba or, or in Vatry in France, and um, build full chart of flight schedule uh, directly from China, from Hong Kong uh, to EU. And, um, and then to arrange truck line all across um, the whole Europe for direct injection into postal networks. So this is the way to, to, to let the flow of uh, parcel. On the, on the last mile side, um, I will say that the 
players are doing quite well and pre-sorting uh, in China to minimize the working process in the warehouse of last mile companies. Um, I will give you two examples. Uh, for, for example, in the US, Chinese players uh, sort all parcel according to 3,500 uh, location of uh, USPS, for example. And uh, in Europe, we observe new trends for delivery like uh, uh, PUDO uh, or Locker's network. So um, at the end, I will say that the flexibility and innovation in supply chain design were the, um, the, the key to, to keep the main flowing during this period. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Eddie. Um, and please stay on uh, because, because I would like to come back um, in a moment or two um, uh, to, to ask another question. Um, Luca, um, thank you for, uh, for staying online. Um, let, me, let me ask you um, um, a further question. Uh, for digital commerce, Logistic uh, obviously is essential. Um, however, in the recent past, cross-border e-commerce uh, grew twice as fast as domestic um, e-commerce. Did the pandemic change this trend for good? Uh, do we have to expect um, similar developments um, already observed in China, where already half of all commerce uh, has been conducted by e-commerce? Do we have to expect uh, this development also in, in Europe? Yeah, thank Look you, Walter. Thank you very much, Walter, for the question. Uh, although I don't have the numbers uh, because it's a difficult estimate to make, I can, of course, comment on, on your question. Um, it's a little bit complicated to understand also the impact of COVID-19 at the moment. Uh, we are running a, um, a report. Uh, we have commissioned a report uh, for the 2021 uh, year covering also 2020 and the impact of COVID-19 on e-commerce, which we published uh, after summer. So we will maybe know a bit more when this document will be, will be available. But there are you know, some conflicting trends within, uh, within this COVID-19 crisis, because as I mentioned before, with the pandemic, we have seen that consumers in some countries remain really more attached than ever to their local merchants. So proximity shops that you can find in your neighborhood. But they now expect these consumers that these shops will also offer them some sort of e-commerce option. At the same time, the development of that e-commerce option may lead to an expansion of the local shop to markets abroad. Uh, it happened, for example, in, a, uh, in Paris uh, for a local cheese shop that was basically selling in its uh, stationary shop uh, just in the neighborhood of Paris. They started selling online the cheese and they found out that actually Belgian consumers are very much interested in buying this cheese. So, after they moved online due to the pandemic, uh, this no local proximity physical store moved online and started selling cross border. So, of course, the COVID 19 pandemic uh, is going to accelerate also cross border, uh, cross border e commerce. Uh, then, we of course, uh, also have the role of platforms. Uh, and here I mean uh, uh, e commerce marketplaces, which are increasingly used by merchants to reach markets abroad that otherwise might be unreachable for them because it might be too complex in terms of legislation. And I don't know, for, for many reasons, there are many reasons for which an SME would decide not to directly sell cross-border to a country, but maybe rely more on a marketplace to, to do some of the work for them. So we have seen an increase in the use of platforms due to the pandemic, especially for merchants that had to close down their physical store and started selling as soon as possible online to survive. So that, this all led, of course, to more e-commerce and I would say also more cross-border e-commerce. Maybe not that much during the first wave of the pandemic, but during the second wave of the pandemic, we can definitely um, say that this has uh, almost went back to normal, at least according to, to what I hear from our members. Um, if it will become like China, uh, I don't know yet. What I would like to see, of course, is uh, that uh, there is no distinction anymore between physical commerce and, and e-commerce because it's all about commerce. It doesn't matter if you sell a product online or offline, what the consumer wants is just to buy the product and they want to have a seamless uh, shopping experience. So we have to make it easy for them. But to make it easy for them, we also need the European Union to make you know, uh, good legislation in that sense and uh, try not to distinguish too much between online and offline as it still happens right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Luca, for that. Um, I would like to move back now to 
uh, to air cargo, um, Glenn, uh, volumes are rising faster than ever. Um, is uh, the infrastructure sufficient to cater for this growth? Are there any particular safety issues which the airlines are concerned with? Um, will digitalization assist in tackling these concerns? Everything uh, is currently uh, un seen under the umbrella of digitalization. Glenn, uh, please, please answer. Uh, I'm very much in interested uh, in your, in your. Thank you, Walter. Um, and we've heard actually just some some very positive aspects from from Luca and Eddie with regards to the growth side and from Nor as well, but also raising the complexity. So the way I like to look at it is as the industry grows my hair losses. So one goes up, one goes down. And as you can see, I can't really have much more loss, which means the industry's had a lot of growth. Um, but, but joking aside, I think the challenges that lay ahead are quite sizable. Um, you know, you have, as Eddie was saying, that you've got an increased demand in business. You've got an increase in demand of, for transparency. Um, and I think, you know, Lucas talked about the, the, the progression going forward, which is going to continue to grow at incredible rates. And I think NOR and the UPU and the other international bodies have, have really identified well in advance the need for enhanced regulatory um, information because safety, security, compliance in general is critical, whether or not it's the stop act so that we know what's actually being moved, or in the case of, of air cargo, looking at the safety side, things like um, lithium batteries, for example. A lot of regulations are, are in place, which actually will ensure they can be shipped safely. But we need to make sure that there is proper and adequate transparency. So the challenges will also be there for the infrastructure. As we've said, you know, there is an increase in, in demand. So there is an, an going to be a challenge on the space that's available. The air cargo industry, by even the most conservative estimates, will double in the next 18 to 20, 20 years. Yet, unfortunately, the space to build new facilities doesn't exist at most airports. So when you can see a proliferation of e-commerce, which going from a B2B environment to a B2C environment means you could move from one consignment of 10,000 smartphones to 10,000 consignments of one smartphone. So you will need to have a, an advanced system of aggregation, of consolidation, you need to do it in a, in a facility that's that's highly automated. And I think has already been mentioned, you know, at, at, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, advanced automation, robotics, all of these will have a significant uh, part to play. Digitalization is critical for optimization. You know, you, you cannot um, expect to double the size of the facility. So you're gonna have to keep the facilities that you've got and maximize the available utilization. So we will need digitalization to ensure that there is greater information. Greater information and, and accelerated flow of information will allow all members of the supply chain to respond uh, more quickly in terms of prep preparing for the cargo or the mail to actually come through. And then actually responding um, to those demands coming through with, as it were, the most efficient solutions in place. So I think there's a lot of challenges going forward, but. But as an industry, we like these challenges. It's much better to have the challenges of growth than ch the challenges of contraction. So I think that the e-commerce and the mail, the, the, the DPOs have been very clear in, in articulating what their expected demands are. And the industry just has to make sure that it, it collaborates with all of the regulatory agencies, with all of the parties involved. Um, and then we can actually have, as it were, uh, an efficient collaborative growth strategy in place with uh, with everybody involved. Exciting times ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. Um, I un understood that um, the harmonization uh, of data related to the consignments, the parcels, the packages, the commercial letter post items um, is at the core of developments uh, and, and really essential. Um, obviously, the UPU played uh, quite a significant role um, in, in the recent past there, um, focusing on safety, security, uh, but also on customs and VAT related issues. Um, so uh, Noah, what is the state of implementation of the uh, UPU global postal model uh, for electronic advanced status 
um, among the designated operators because we understood that uh, many areas, regions, national um, uh, areas are of course focusing currently on implementing all those those uh, digital prerequisites on a mandatory basis. So there is a certain fear, of course, that the e-commerce flows might even be stopped by authorities. Noor, what is the, the state of play? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. And definitely the state of play is very important. As you said, the impact uh, can be very disastrous. So. As uh, Glenn also mentioned, uh, and uh, one of the main objective and uh, activities of the uh, UPU's EAD uh, steering committee is to harmonize these uh, regulations uh, in, in such a way that uh, they, they, there's harmony and there's no disruption to the uh, global supply chain when it comes to the movement of small, uh, uh, small items containing goods. So, uh, as I said, the UPU's global postal model was built to address the technical requirements, the message and standards required for the implementation of electronic advanced data. And the global postal model has eight messaging flows, which are all in place right now. And also the supporting messaging standards, the IT systems and the operational procedures are, are, are all there. Of course, capacity building is one of the main thing that, as I said earlier, the UPU is doing to help the designated operators, the adoption of the global postal model, and therefore to address and accommodate all these emerging regulations that you just mentioned. Uh, although all the eight flaws are in place, there are still some outstanding issues that the UPU is working with all the stakeholders to try and address. Some of these include, of course, the EDI standards, the standards uh, and, uh, and the codes between the floors three and four. These are the floors between the customs, uh, especially the destination customs when it is sending back uh, information on uh, referral or notification of, of a kind. Uh, there's also uh, an area that right now uh, the UPU and the, the uh, working groups and the World Custom Organization, and of course the European Commission and all the rest of the stakeholders, IATA and ICAO, is the EAD uh, transit model. Because initially the, it was origin to destination, but transit is becoming a very key important area. And that's an area that right now is under, uh, 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 under consideration and is being worked on by the different working groups. Uh, the global postal model and how to align with other systems, as you said, the ICS2 and the U UPU uh, is very much engaged with the European Commission uh, through all the working groups of the union, uh, such as the uh, customs group, the transport group, the security group, and several other expert teams that are working with the ICS2 working groups also to try and align those alignments required between the global postal model and uh, especially currently the system that is, uh, has come into place is the European one, which is the ICS2. Uh, we are also working on the referral protocols, which is very important and to build the capacity uh, on how to manage referrals. And uh, in this area, the UPU, of course, uh, in uh, the last Postal Operation Council did uh, endorse the, uh, some of the issues regarding re referrals, such as the do not load protocols, which is very important. In, uh, in the December session and something that is a document that is now being presented and promoted through the projects I mentioned to the UPU community to uh, understand and get guidance on how to deal with that. Very important and of course, which was uh, very much disrupted by COVID-19 was the piloting because 2020 was, uh, as I said, the final year of preparation and some of the preparation activities was to pilot these flows. Unfortunately, that was disrupted because uh, as uh, we, we, we discussed uh, earlier, uh, the COVID-19 really disrupted the transport network. Therefore, the piloting could not take place. And that is something that we hope to uh, engage soon. So uh, basically, as I said, the UPU is working with all, all the stakeholders, uh, whether it is the associations and whether it is intergovernmental organizations similar to UPU like ICAO and the regulatory bodies to harmonize. One of the main important thing you mentioned about harmonization is there's a working group between World Customs Organization where the European Commission is also involved, harmonizing the custom declaration forms, the CN22 and CN23. They're really working on harmonization of that because these are the forms that really form the basis of the data that is being declared. So 
the, the, this is really a, a very busy time for all of us, as Glenn said, and an interesting time, and uh, we see how it will span out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. And I would like to pick up um, one of the questions coming in um, already for Noor. Um, there has been a comment that Africa is the next growth continent in terms of e-commerce co um, uh, development, uh, obviously. Um, and uh, how uh, could electronic advanced data compliance, um, what role of e-commerce Europe, the UPU, TIACA and other logistic integrators uh, could play to open the way for Africa as the next growth continent uh, of e-commerce. Noor, could you give us um, a short insight? Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, and really very, very important and very nice question. Thank you for that. Uh, as uh, maybe Luca is also aware, uh, this the Ecomat Africa project that has really been addressing how to open up the Africa region for the e-commerce and, of course, benefit from all the uh, benefits that come with e-commerce. Uh, this, of course, got disrupted also like any other disruption, but the e-commerce at Africa project is really live, and this is one of the main initiatives the UPU is doing to uh, open up that region to e-commerce and uh, take for advantage of the benefits that uh, come with it. Therefore, but when we come specifically to electronic advanced data, again, uh, the region is heavily benefiting from those uh, UPU's global projects, especially the, uh, the EAD project. And uh, I believe uh, all the members of the region are benefiting from and participating in this project. And therefore a lot of uh, ongoing work to help them build the capacity and the capability to be able to uh, transmit electronic advanced data and benefit from uh, the requirements of the e-commerce consignment that are attracting these regulations. Uh, as we speak now, uh, other than the capacity building in terms of training and deployment, the projects are also uh, helping in equipping these designated operators because some of them are challenged with basic equipments to be able to, so that infrastructural support is also being supported through these projects. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Noor. And I would like to add to that because both of us have the pleasure to witness uh, very, very positive developments based on, on the uh, deployment of, of electronic advanced data. Um, only a couple of weeks ago um, in the Pacific uh, region, Vanuatu, for instance, moved up from its previous status of a least developed country even certain steps up to be a, a more developed country based on what they established uh, with electronic advanced data and a single customs window fully based on digital means with uh, the help of course not only uh, the uh, UPU but also UNCTAD and others but there are lots of possibilities emerging through digitalization. Um, so a lot of work has been conducted and a lot of work is, uh, is ongoing. Thank you Noor. Um, with that, I would like to move to, to Eddie again, um, because Eddie is also a, a leading expert on returns management, as well as cross-border fulfillment in e-commerce, um, crossing, crossing continents. With ever rising volumes of low value consignment, is it sustainable to send items back to sellers um, uh, cross borders, Eddie? Oh, thank you, Walter. Um, I, I, I just want to say a few words about um, Africa and uh, the, the remark from Noah, please. Um, we strongly believe that uh, Africa is the next challenge for, for e-commerce and uh, we can see a strong demand um, from our partners, uh, Chinese partners, like um, a company like Spida for other companies that are willing to, to develop uh, and to, to, play a, to play a role and uh, collaborate with posts in Africa. So this is, an, uh, this is a, and, and um, back to returns. Um, um, I recently read that uh, uh, returns are the second most difficult part of the online retail journey for consumers. So as you know, for even for posts or for retailers is still a, a big challenge. Um, our company Shop and Back is helping brand multi-channel retailers and logistic players on the, on the wool um, uh, value chain of reverse logistics with a tech platform and a key logistic solution optimized for returns. Um, regarding the question, uh, sustainability is really key for us and uh, our customers and, uh, and uh, the solution that we, um, that we can generate for, for, for them is to, 
to help creating value generation from e-commerce return and uh, decreasing waste. Low value item is still, um, is still um, a, a big issue when we come to returns because usually, uh, and you're right, they are not worthful enough to return uh, abroad when we talk about um, cross-border returns. Um, for, for example, most of the low value uh, parcel today are from China, as you, as you know. And uh, if consumer claim for return, mostly Chinese sellers will prefer as them to uh, ask the consumer to keep to keep the item so to get refund and to keep it. Um, the key issue is um, is the return cost is much higher than shipping costs sometimes, and plus um, we can face the the difficulty uh, to get the tax and duty back on uh, higher value items, which is also in, in our case in our in our return business um, um, a large issue. Um, we can we can see that. Um, some marketplace like AliExpress or other, they, they provide return insurance to seller. So when customer want to return, for example, the insurance will cover the cost. So this is one of the possibility, but our, our recommendation for, for, um, for um, um, merchant is to arrange local returns and uh, don't send it back to China. So many players now in Europe are focusing on this um, return to local and send to second end market. Uh, which is better, better, better for environment and better for the planet and can help to increase the uh, resale value of product up to 50%, which is quite uh, interesting and quite good. And, um, and you need a, a reverse, uh, reverse supply chain really flexible for that. But um, this, is, this, is, this is the point. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, and uh, I would like to, um, to pick up uh, one of our questions uh, directly to Eddie as well. Um, Mark van der Horst um, is asking um, a question related to the changes in the VAT de minimis regulation. Um, how will this, uh, in your view, Eddie, impact e-commerce sales um, from instance from China to Europe and related shipping uh, through postal operators? Will this drive change in the overall logistic solutions? I mean, this is aiming very much at, at the import one-stop shop system, yeah, the special arrangements, the change in, in bulk clearance. Um, all this will happen on the, on, on the 1st of July. Um, this is very high up on the agenda of very many fulfillment companies. So Eddie, give us an insight. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, actually, this is not a very easy topic. And um, when, we, when we prepare and we talk about that, um, many players say that um, they are already ready with the compliance of um, electronic advance uh, declaration. And um, I think for, for, for us, what we can see is uh, it can help to, to reorganize and to um, all players that we are helping to, to do cross-border from China, mainly from China to EU, uh, are, are ready for that. And, um, and so they, they really say that um, there is different way uh, today to do cross-border. Uh, but um, the, the type of collaboration that we are, that we are doing with customs, with a postal network, and um, should not change that much. That means they are ready for that uh, and prepare that for, for, for many months and uh, years. So, so they are not afraid about that and say that, uh, of course, the minimis will, um, will, be, uh, will be a game changer. But now, um, uh, compared to, to the past years, there is a lot of last mile option and um, different type of channels that, um, that they can use. I think in the same time, it will, uh, it will help to, um, to um, to, uh, to, to, to not focus only uh, on the um, low value product. And to, we can see like from merchant, for example, they are now want to focus on, on um, uh, heavy and bulky items, for example, from Asia to EU with a higher value product, which is good actually. And so, because if we only focus on, the, on, on this market, we have the same trend in Europe, I'm based in France and, and we, we have the same trend during, during the last 10 years like uh, starting with a low product and low value, but now people are moving more and more in, into, uh, into high value products. So I think the, um, the, the, the change in the, in the VAT and the declaration is a, is a good move for, for e-commerce and players are ready for that. Thank you, thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, but I'm sure we are touching upon this topic uh, many times in, in the not, not too distant future again. 
with that, um, unfortunately, our time is up. So I would like to thank all of you uh, for your very good questions and thank you um, to our panelists for answering them. Questions not answered will be answered after the webinar when you kindly share your email address for doing so. Let me thank again the panelists and uh, in particular, of course, the Secretary General of E-Commerce Europe for his insightful presentation today. This has been the first of three webinars hosted by the Consultative Committee of the Universal Postal Union on the various aspects of e-commerce. The second webinar is already scheduled for the 28th of April on how have e-shoppers' behaviors changed in the context of COVID. The third webinar will be dedicated to redefining the universal service obligation in a changing digital postal environment, both again at 11 uh, to uh, 12 uh, Brussels or Bern time. Thank you for participating and looking very much forward to your participation in the upcoming two webinars. Thank you very much. And with that, goodbye and have a safe and secure day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.